Okay. Everything seem okay? Uh, Tim, we're all all right? Yeah. You can see the slides? Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be joined today by William Jones uh, from Ember Cosm, um, a company based in, here in Southampton, um, doing all sorts of different um, different research and technology development in compilers and AI, and, and you, you'll hear all about it from William. Uh, so Dr. Jones has a research background in computational neuroscience. He's focused on the areas of consciousness, cognition, and metacognition. In industry, before his current role, William had a short but highly successful stint as the co-founder and CTO of the cryptocurrency Arweave. Have I said that right? Arweave. In his current role, Dr. Jones heads AI and machine learning efforts at Embercosm, a consultancy that solves open source problems in many challenging areas with a focus on compilers, tool chains, embedded systems, and operating systems. His current work is focused on Bayesian methods and statistical computing. So uh, please join me in welcoming William. Thank you for doing this talk on uh, dynamicals modeling lessons from neuroscience through fintech. As Rob has said, um, I'm from Endocosm and I'm the AI and machine learning lead at Endocosm. Um, we do, as you said, uh, compilers, tool chains, embedded systems, operating systems, and of course, AI and machine learning. And what I'm talking about today is an interesting project that is taking some of the stuff that was sort of parallel some of the work I did. Uh, during my PhD and takes it out of the in your imaging space and puts it into the finance space. Um, because essentially there's some interesting overlap and some sort of potential for interesting novel problem solving here. So a quick overview of, of what we're doing here. What our approach to modeling in this case is, is a, a latent variable modeling. So we take a view of the world with our model that we have some observed variables that we can see and we have over time period. And then what is modulating those variables is a large number of latent variables that we, that we can't directly observe, so a latent variable system. And yeah, so practical applications of this currently are neuroimaging. So in the neuroimaging case, what we are doing, what we're interested in doing is we take neurophysiological readings like fMRI, EEG, and we're trying to infer a dynamical system, a latent variable system inside the brain that explains how we got those readings. Specifically, something like fMRI gives us a lot of spatial resolution about brain activity. What it doesn't tell us is how different brain regions are interacting with one another in order to, um, in order to produce the things that we're seeing. So sort of the application at the moment. And where we're interested in applying from this is essentially that the, the types of dynamical systems that we are working with here, the, these differential equations, are well directly parallel. They are literally the stuff we're using to solve a bunch of different finance problems. But we're solving it at, at a sort of um, different evidence-based angle that uh, potentially lends itself to some interesting applications, which is what I'll talk about a little bit later. Anyway, so that, that's a sort of a brief introduction to what I'm talking about today. For the rest of the talk, I'm going to go over the DCM stuff, I'm going to go over in a bit more detail the, the rationalization of what we're doing with it in finance, and I'm going to talk about sort of where we practically are with this project at the moment as well. So first things first, let's talk about DCM, uh, of course, modeling, if it is. The core of everything we're doing here is about dynamical systems. What is a dynamical system? A dynamical system is a way of modeling the world that consists of two things. A state, which is uh, the state of the world at a given time point. I've got an example of planets up here. And a rule for how that state changes over time. So if we advance one time step, how does our state change? In this example of the planets, this would be, this would be the rules of physics, telling us how much force is acting on one planet from all of the others. And typically what we would like to do with such a dynamical system is ideally we would like to solve it. We, we, we have here a state and a differential equation describing what that state does over time. And what we would like to do is we would like to solve the time. Um, unfortunately, we, we won't discuss this much further because um, because it's sort of a, a thing we take to be true. We, we generally can't solve these, sub, these systems. We, we have to resort to numerical methods and, and that's what we will be doing today. Um, anyway, th these dynamical systems are sort of 
what we are interested in in dynamic rules and modeling in a sense that we we know some bits of our system and we have a rough idea of what the other constituent parts are but th th those things are sort of uh, remain to be worked out so just quickly before we talk about that in more detail the the there, there is one complication that we often have to deal with in practice and will have to deal with practice with dynamic rules and modeling, which is that a lot of the, you know, this is a deterministic dynamic rule system as I've just described it. All of, all of our things are sort of nice and deterministic. In the real world, we often don't have the luxury of the dealing with determinism and we have to deal with uncertainty or randomness about the things in our system. We're taking our variables and we're replacing them with random variables. This conceptually doesn't really change what we're doing, but it does make things uh, substantially more complicated on the, the computing side. Um, and just two things to quickly say about that. Um, sort of one thing really. If you introduce randomness into a dynamical system, you make everything, or it, it, you can very quickly make the whole dynamical system non deterministic and random. Um, just to sort of make this point. If I have some uncertainty about the mass of my moon here, I have some uncertainty about how it affects everything else and how those things affect other things. And essentially, the point is that once I start sprinkling a little bit of uh, non-determinism in my dynamical system, the whole thing becomes non-deterministic um, very, very quickly. But other than that, things are simply the same. Anyway, so those are a very quick overview of dynamical systems. What I am interested in doing in the context of dynamic rules and modeling is taking, say, two things that I've observed over time. Say, I observed sun F and planet B over 100 years. And what I want to do is come up with the best possible model of all of the other planets that might or might not exist, which are causing the, you know, the, the state that we see of the planets that we have, so the position, the metal, and velocity, say, of those things. Um, and particularly here, the sort of challenge of this technique is that not only am I dealing with known unknowns, not only am I dealing with something like fill in the gaps here, I know that I know the position of planet B and sun F, and I want to find out the position of all the other ones, what the most likely positions are. I also potentially have to deal with unknown unknowns, in that I might not know how many other things there are in my system that I have to deal with. Uh, and that makes things a lot more difficult. I end up with not just sort of filling in the blanks, but I end up with challenging model selection problem over a set of like sort of quite complicated models. Yeah, that, that is conceptually what we are trying to do with dynamic rules modeling. And in the new imaging application, the known things that we are dealing with are the new imaging stuff, FMI, EUG, and the unknowns are the different or the voxels that make up the, the different regions of the brain. So the question is then, how do we go from this idea of having, of trying to infer a probabilistic dynamical system, a like variable model from some observations, to like actually doing that? It's a nice thing to say, but how do we realize it? And the way we realize it, sort of conceptually, is just with statistics. Um, it would be nice to end it there, but, but think that obviously that, that's not a very satisfying explanation. Uh, and specifically, the way we do do this in practice is with Bayesian statistics. So if you haven't met Bayesian methods before, I'm just, I'm just going to quickly talk through sort of conceptually what we're doing here and thinking why we're doing it. So when we do classical frequentist statistics, the, the statistics that we sort of we do generally at all the school, we define probability to be a frequency of occurrence. So if I have a coin and I flip it and it's a fair coin and I have a 50% odd, odds of getting heads, then that means if I flip that coin an infinite number of times, then proportionally, 50 out of 100 times, heads will come up. That's what probability means in a classical frequent distance. And the way that I do statistics in this, in this classical frequent probability is, well, I answer questions like, I make a hypothesis like the following, I believe my coin is fair, and then if I want to test this hypothesis, I go away, I flip my coin 100 times, see how many times it lands on heads, and what I'm interested in is how likely my data, the observations of those 100 coin flips are in the context of the hypothesis that I pose being true. So we're particularly interested in the green term here, the likelihood of the data given the hypothesis. That's what we, we want to do, in the, well, typically what we're interested in in uh, frequent distance. But that's not the only way we can do valid statistics. We can also define a, we can also define probability in a valid way in a way that amounts to a uh, degree of belief or propensity. And when we do that, 
we, we get some sort of interesting benefits and there's some interesting consequences. The, 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 the first consequence of this is that because probability is a degree of belief or propensity, I can assign a degree of belief directly to a hypothesis. So when we were doing things in the frequentist world, I spoke about us testing hypothesis like this point is fair by seeing how I do the data is in the context of the hypothesis. And we can we do things this way because you know in our view of probability as a frequency of occurrence, a hypothesis can either be true or it cannot be true. It's just the way things are. In the Bayesian world, because the probability is a degree of belief, we can you know, we, we can say things like I believe this hypothesis, so I have a 50% degree of belief in this hypothesis, which is I know something uh, something that is convenient to do for these zero percent set. Um, and mechanically, what this means is that skipping over some details is that when we are doing Bayesian statistics, what we do is we are not interested in this likelihood, this green term here, the likelihood of the data given our, given our hypothesis. We're interested in the converse, the likelihood of our hypothesis given the data, because it, make, it makes sense to be able to do that because we can assign a probability to our hypothesis itself. Uh, and mechanically, we realize that with baseball work, it's, it's statistics. Um, and essentially, we start with a prior probability, how likely we believe our hypothesis to be without any data. We multiply that by our sort of uh, our treatment is likely to the that we discussed, and then what we typically are often interested in is posterior, like a bit of a hypothesis given some data. So that is the sort of Bayesian method and you know, the, the sort of broad approach to what we're doing here. So why are we applying this method? In Why is this our, our choice method in this case? Why are we taking this approach particularly to sort of statistically solve our problem? There, there's sort of two reasons. The first one is that it essentially the, the view of the Bayesian view of probability as a degree of belief is a very, very helpful one for the fact that we're solving. We're essentially trying to reverse engineer a complicated latent variable dynamical system from, from just a small amount of observations of that. Um, and the, the likelihood is we don't have enough information to do that properly. There's not the sense in which we are going to get the right answer out of this, we're just going to get the best answer possible. Um, and because of this, and just because because of the practically what we're doing, it's very very useful for us to get to to look at the Bayesian view of things, which gives us a, a probability of a bunch of different things being right. Essentially, instead of there having to be one true correct solution, we can have a probability distribution over all the different solutions, and respectively how likely each one is. So this is sort of helpful to us to to, to understand the uh, our space of solutions, um, rather than just saying there's an answer that's useful to us. The other thing we get out of Bayesian methods is intrinsic knowledge. We can, mechanically through the prior, well, yeah, the, the prior probability that I described here, have a way of accounting for knowledge that we have independent of the data before looking at the data. And in the context of the type of problem we're trying to solve with the dynamic causal model, this is really, really important. Again, because we are starting from a small set of observations and we're trying to infer a latent variable system, there, there are a lot of possible answers to these latent variable systems. And if we want a good and useful answer, we have to narrow those down. And one of the ways we're going to narrow them down is by taking advantage of intrinsic knowledge about the problem. Um, yeah, otherwise, we simply end up sort of searching for the, the best mechanical fit over very wide space of models, which isn't necessarily the most useful and important thing. Yeah, oh, that's probably I'm supposed to use that. Anyway, so if that's conceptually, if that is data statistics, and we conceptually what we're conceptually what we're doing, how are we using these to realise the the model selection and the parameter finding in the dynamical model? Modeling? So I, I've described sort of the approach up to this point. We have a probabilistic dynamical system, and we we have many different plausible probabilistic dynamical systems of some observed data system of hidden variables that we, we can't do any measure. And somehow, from what I've described, we want to use Bayesian statistics to, to figure that out. And, and in what we've got at the moment, we, we have this fire probability, but we haven't really got any further than that. So the way we are going to realize this with Bayesian statistics is conceptually based breaking up and down into two sets. The first is that the, the first is that we are going to select the specific dynamic, so dynamical systems model of our data we want to use. 
So particularly, we are interested in what variables are going into our state and how those variables are related to each other and are affecting each other. In the context of our planets example, this would be something like selecting the number of other planets that we want to deal with. And we want to do this independent of any particular parameters of the system. So we, in the context of the planets example, we want to select how many other planets we are dealing with independent of this sort of position, that's in velocity or whatever they may be. And once we've done that, we have uh, the, the sort of other plot of, of essentially filling in the gaps of our um, thing, the system. Once we know what the structure is, it's sort of a much easier problem to be able to, to figure out what the parameters are. Uh, essentially, we, we just sort of uh, take the posterior and, and that gives us the answer, the high level. So how are we going to do these two things in the context of the basics that this has described? We are go well, we would, there are some caveats to this that we will talk about in a second, but what we would like to do is we would like to solve the model selection problem by comparing the likelihoods of our different models. Um, and the way we're going to realize this independent of any model parameters is the integrated term of now. There's some problems with that, which is there. And once we have chosen the model that has the best likelihood, we're, we're, we're going to figure out a theory for that model, um, and, and that's going to give us the essence of our parameters. That's sort of conceptually what we want to do here. Um, unfortunately, it turns out that, well, it doesn't turn out, it's simply a fact that this integral can really, really, really hard to solve. Integrating the parameters out is not something that is done easily. If you have a smallish problem, you can sort of get at these type of intractable integrals with Gibbs sampling, something like that, or at least you can get the likelihood of Gibbs sampling, something like that. But for those sort of scalar problems, we're interested in solving that's not useful. So what we do instead is shortly we, we use an approximation to the likelihood and posterior probability that is easy to calculate very, very quickly. We essentially assume that these probability distributions have a certain form that is Gaussian, and then we try and find the best Gaussian that fits the data. Um, our measure of doing this is called free energy, and it's something that can be evaluated with a few tricks for a very, 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 very wide space of models very quickly, um, assuming a certain uh, criteria from there. Um, and that. Uh, that gives us essentially at a higher level the dynamic causal modeling methodology. What we want, so to go over that again, what we want to do is we have some observations of the world and we want to pick the best dynamical systems model that explains those observations, selecting between potentially quite a large space of models. We're going to specify these sort of broad space of models we're interested in, which is going to be probably be very little broad ahead of time. We're, that we're going to encode all of the things that we know about our problem in advance is the prior that will fit into the prior. And then the way we are going to realize, the way we're going to realize selecting our dynamical system is through like the ratios uh, we've been here. And then the way that we are going to realize finding what the, the specific parameters of our chosen dynamical system are is with a posterior. So that is the, the sort of dynamical model approach to solving problems. Um, current applications of this technology, there's sort of two interesting ones I want to talk about, which contrast interestingly. Um, there, there's the new imaging approach I've discussed so far, and uh, I've sort of spoken about this already. Here, the problem is we want to understand how different regions of the brain are interacting with one another. We have neuroimaging images, something like fMRI or EEG, which give us I mean, depending on the technique, sort of a, a, a loose sense of what brain activity is at any given point, but don't directly tell us how the mechanical, how the different bits of the brain are mechanically interacting. And what we want to do is we want to understand this by taking this neuroimaging measure um, and uh, and finding the uh, and the things we know about the brain and finding the best analytical distance model that explains how all of the bits of the brain are working together as best we can. Um, and specifically here, what we're interested in most is the dynamical systems model we get out of this. That's the thing we, uh, uh, that's of interest to us. So, uh, yeah, we are interested in training on the observed variables to observe this, this dynamical system. Another application of this technology that sort of has been done in the last few years is, uh, is modeling the COVID pandemic. This is a slightly different application. It's actually a bit more similar than the type of stuff we're interested in looking at. Um, 
Uh, and the setup here is a little bit different. We have quite a good idea here in case of pandemic what, like, what the form of the model that we should make should be. It's not like the uh, neuro imaging models where we don't necessarily know what different brain regions are going to be interacting with each other. We have quite a good idea of what different things should go into our data and how they should be interacting. Uh, and so here the goal is more to, to create a useful dynamic assistance model that lets us get it to be directly in order which are difficult to observe, like you know, social distancing, for example, um, on the basis of positive COVID tests and deaths. And, and specifically, the, the goal here is not to sort of create an interesting dynamic assistance model so much as to create a dynamic assistance model that we can just wind forward into the future and make useful predictions with. And uh, yeah, that, that is sort of the stuff we're interested in. So, how much time I've used? The, 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 the reasons we're interested in this particularly, I mean, we're sort of interested in applying this technique more widely in general. There's sort of some, some useful properties it brings which are, are, are interesting to a wide group of problems. But we're particularly interested in this model in the context of finance. Because of the sort of natural overlap between the, the differential equation models and systems models that are used in finance, like the, this is the natural model for um, I think. Um, there is a sort of natural overlap between these and the types of dynamical systems models we created in finance. But specifically, the, generally, the models in finance are not inferred in the same way that the ones we're inferring are. So typically, the you know, things like this were designed by Black and Scholes just essentially thinking about the block uh, and, um, uh, and reasoning about things, whereas we have taken a sort of interesting interesting evidence-based approach. So there is some sort of interesting stuff to look at there. The other interesting thing um, that's sort of going on here is that the in, finan in financial models, we often wish to take advantage of measures that well, we potentially wish to take advantage of measures that are difficult to get at directly. There are some measures like the sum total of transactions in an economy. Um, so I give you five pounds, you give someone else five pounds, they give me five pounds, so total is 15 instead of zero. Um, there, there are some measures like this, which are, for example, very, very good at measuring how currency flows around an economy, but are nigh on impossible to directly measure because they're just sort of challenging to directly observe. But if you are using a related variable model, like the one that, 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 that we are describing, you can get at these measures and you can both sort of potentially say useful things about them and you can put them in your models and then have your best guess at them inferred. Um, and uh, this is potentially a sort of another interesting, useful thing that, that uh, interesting, useful research that I should look at, which is difficult to get that well. Thirdly and finally, our, our so the third interest in this is just that the dynamic causal modeling approach is a good way to solve quite a lot of problems uh, in some respects. Particularly, it is a good way to solve problems in finance because because we are not inferring we are in some ways not inferring a solution directly, but inferring a dynamic system that infers our solution. What we end up with at the end is a system which has quite a lot more explainability, robustness, and because of the way the, the basic statistics we use, ways of dealing with uncertainty and risk than some other approaches. So there's sort of some some nice general properties there as well. I would love to be able to tell you that having had this, this brilliant idea that, that I've gone away and done it and it was easy. Unfortunately, that is not the case. We were going to quite a lot of the challenges uh, doing this. Um, and quite a lot of these challenges sort of stem from the fact that the um, the code base we're dealing with is, I mean, it's widely used research code, but it is ultimately research code. Um, so, for example, you know, th this Technique is currently maintained in the, the SDM 12 toolbox, um, and this is stuff that's written in MATLAB as well. Um, and MATLAB is it's fine, it's great, it's very, very quick at doing matrix operations, which we do a lot of, um, but it's also expensive, it's not really an open source, which is something we, we very much don't like. Um, and it is, well, you can compile MATLAB, but it is, it is generally used in this context uh, as an interpreted language. Um, and and uh, I do want to just say credit where credit's due, the SDM team. Do make things back with Octave, which is essentially a source map app. Um, but if MATLAB is sometimes slow, Octave is really slow, um, sort of impractical so in many cases. Um, but it is a very good project. Another challenge, I've sort of said, is already research code base. Um, again, the SPM team have done, I don't want to rubbish their efforts, they have done a very, very good job, but it, it is ultimately research code. Um, 
the code quality and the code quality and sort of commenting is, for example, very, very mixed. There are some bits of the code which are beautifully written, beautifully commented, and there are some bits of the code which are not. Um, and it's very, very unclear what's going on. Um, the systems of documentation is also sort of not consistent as far as I can tell. There's very, very good end user documentation if you want to use this stuff, but if you want to understand how all the bits fit together uh, and why and what they are doing, then, then you're, you're kind of out of luck. Um, also, stuff like testing, as best we can tell, I mean, they might have a sort of hidden uh, in house one, but as best we can tell, there's really any testing for this as well. I'm sure the maintainers test their code as they go along, but they don't seem to have unit testing, negotiation testing, or system tests at all, um, which is, well, it's very annoying for one, um, uh, and something we feel should probably be in there. On a similar vein, the current theory for this stuff is, um, I don't want to be rude, it's a little bit of juice. It, it's not badly written, but it is written by specialists for other specialists. And frankly, even as somebody who mostly understands this stuff, it is really, really, really difficult to use as reference material. It's, um, it is written to be very, very correct and not necessarily with sort of user friendliness in mind. Um, uh, and you know, th th this, this is sort of a, a, a challenge. Um, and, uh, this is a challenge both from the point of view that we have to be understanding this stuff, but also because we have to be communicating about it. Um, and it is difficult to do so when, when the reference text is, is not so accessible. Finally, we also have to deal with the, the sort of restricted scope of, of the current technology. And I mean this in two senses. So there's obviously, you know, this stuff lives in a new imaging toolbox, so it's set up for new imaging problems. Can't really fault anybody for that. That's sort of our, our problem to deal with, uh, and we can deal with it. Um, but also, this technology has been sort of widely applied in your energy for like 50 years at this point. And so it's sort of been field tested, and at least some of the kinks and issues have been worked out for this particular application. Whereas for our application, we try to apply it to new fields, finance. We haven't really worked out all the kinks yet. There's certainly going to be some challenges there. And we've sort of seen this a bit already with the. Um, the pandemic one, like this was sort of a fresh application of the technology and it mostly worked, but then also because we were doing things differently, it kind of didn't work in some ways, and some of the predictions were, were, were not necessarily quite as good as they could have been um, in, in some ways. So, where does that leave us at the moment? Um, well, first thing, at, at the moment, the, the sort of first thing we're doing is re realizing this code in uh, it, not in that lab essentially. Uh, particularly, we are realizing a, a, a sort of piece of documented implementation in C++ that, that we will open source in the future. Um, and there's a sort of two goals there. I mean, we, we, want, we want a free and open source version of this code that is sort of coherent, clearly documented and understandable. Um, and, and also, we want to see if we can squeeze a bit more performance out there. I mean, we're, we're probably not going to be beating that lab with our metric operation, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of other scope to make the current the research code be a bit more performance oriented. We've also got the work on this finance model job. Um, we can sort of, you know, test uh, small systems, but as I've said, there, there's going to be quite a lot of things to work out when it comes to applying this to an entirely new field um, and working out exactly how far it's going to work um, and what is not going to work. We sort of an ongoing challenge out there. Looking to the future, all the trouble, essentially what we are trying to do with this project is We've got to finish a robust C++ implementation, a properly documented open source one, but realize our financial model is not And we also have to do some serious communication. Um, we, there has to be, if we want people to use this technology, if we want to, if we want to use this technology, we have to write some proper giving documentation about how it all fits together. We have to write a more accessible theory for some reason that really exists. On that note, um, we are uh, proposing an internship on this, uh, this project over the summer. Um, this will be paid at the same rate as a fresh graduate member of staff would be, which would be, can I say Jeremy? Uh, 56k uh, per year, so 14k per month, which would be a three month project. By the time anyone gets to this project, I suspect the code will be if not done and very, very, very well in the way. Um, and there will be a sort of broad range of topics that could be addressed here. Examples that we have thought of are, we want this to be quick, it's quick, to be quick, easy, Quickness is sort of the Achilles heel of basic technology, and uh, all we can do to address that is good. And this is both at the level of sort of realizing the existing implementation in a more efficient way and working on the unlocking algebra to make sure that that is actually quick. Um, 
there's almost an endless amount of work to do on the financial modeling side of things. We're going to try a lot of things there, and a lot of them are not going to work. We've got to get through that as quickly as we can. Um, and there's also a lot of, as I said, a lot of communication to do um, on the issue. Ideal candidates for this. There's a lot of things to do here, so we're interested in the exceptional candidates as much as anything else. But this is ultimately a sort of challenging population statistics project, so we would be interested in seeing people with mathematical literacy, especially in the algebra and stats. Um, computing and programmability is going to be a lot of C++ here, probably algebra and algebra as well, and communication skills. Anyway, that is the end of the presentation. Are there any questions? Um, yes, I, I have a question. Hello? Yeah, that's fine. I'm just trying to turn you up a bit. So, do, do you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah, um, it's just uh, regarding the theory behind this, um, you know, modeling the, the brain the or, or the intelligence system. I would, I'm just curious. Um, you know, there are research and books talking about that human intelligence is not in the brain. There's actually three parts um, of the human intelligence involved. You've got the, the brain is just one part of it. The, um, you've got the heart intelligence and they got the gut intelligence. And that were constitutes the whole sort of intelligence system in the human body. Um, so how did you account for, did you account for them at all? Uh, or um, what's your thoughts about that? So, you know, in, in order to improve your, or improve your understanding of intelligence in a human body in order to improve your model? I think there's sort of two interesting things to say there. Uh, well, two, two, two things to say there. One is that this sort of is in some sense, a, the, the way this has been applied in your imaging to this point is sort of restricted in scope, right? In that it, it, it is sort of trying to reverse engineer how the grey matter of the brain is doing things from images of how the grey matter is working. Um, so in, in that sense, it's sort of restricted. But you know, the, this the, the the approach I've described with you know sort of latent variables, gut and uh, heart things might be difficult to directly observe. But if you did want to model, this is probably the way to do it, as long as you can describe how they interact with other things. I mean, the the interesting part here. This is why it's like, for example, the, the heart intelligence, um, it's connected to the brain. It, basically, the heart tells more the brain what to do than the brain does the heart. So this is uh, uh, the role of the, uh, the intelligence in the heart has got direct effect on how the brain function. Uh, so when you model the, the, the brain function, the, I, I'm just curious seeing whether do you see, see something viable consideration to see what kind of information, type of information that um, could it I think change if, model? if you wanted to put this kind of thing into the model, you, you very much could. Um, it, the model is very, very good at dealing with um, unknown or, or perhaps difficult to quantify quantities like this, as long as you can tell, as long as you have a rough idea of how they're interacting with other things. So if you wanted to get at that type of question, I don't think it's being done at the moment, but you could. All right, thank you very much. How is this actually different to active inference? Because that's something I've seen and it seems this kind of is, predates it, I think. Yes, this is sort of the precursor to active inference. Um, did you, maybe you guys had a talk about active inference, you, you might have said a few weeks ago. Um, I saw it actually inference. a long time ago with, in London. There was like, there, there, there was quite a few meetups on this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, so you, as you said, this is essentially, the, the, or this work was the precursor to uh, active inference, but whereas an analogy could be drawn that this is sort of a supervised learning problem where we are using the um, free energy criterion to establish a, a, a model of some data, whereas active inference is sort of a, a reinforcement learning problem about intelligent agents learning to interact with the environment. Okay, thanks. Okay, we've got a question from the floor. Yeah. Okay, so um, the, I like the analogy you gave of the uh, model of the planetary system. So you said um, that it's like you get say people have like information about two of the bodies um, and you want to infer the rest of the solar system as a related variable system. Yep. But you said um, that like the, for instance the number of other planets in the system is something you sort of have to provide as a prior. You don't have to provide it as a prior, but you well th this is sort of a thing that's up to you, right? Where it's when you're considering the search base of models you have to ask yourself what is a sensible upper and lower bound of these things right. otherwise your search space is infinite and uh, that might take quite a while. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, you were first. <laughs> um, you sort of skipped across the technical details of how you learned these cool models. How closely related is it to Jude Pearl's uh, structure for causal models? This um, this is actually a, a, a very good question because um, I mean this technique uh, was sort of being developed when I was um, still in uh, still in school, <laughs> um, but this this technique is uh, I understand essentially the brainchild of um, um, a lot of the stuff Bishop was doing at the time and a lot of the stuff that Pearl was doing at the time. It is very very similar to, to um, a lot of Pearl's work. I think it was quite strongly inspired by. So you use their standard training methods to to infer these latent variables. Yeah. You, you don't do anything. You you haven't developed any new research methods. No, no, no. They, we, we we are taking an existing research method and applying it to a new domain. That's our sort of novel contribution. Okay. Sure. Um. So going back to the like the dynamic system of these Yep. Um. So you've obviously got to approach the lab. How does that work on, say, a, like a chaotic dynamic system where your initial conditions have a much bigger effect in place than anything else? Would this approach still work in most cases? Yes, this is actually sort of the the, the issue I was getting at with the uh, the unsolved dynamical systems. Um, we're, we're in the very, very fortunate position with the, with the current applications of this method. What we're really interested in is, is that we have some of the bodies over a time period, and what we're mostly interested in is referring a system over that time period. So it doesn't matter too much to us if it's chaotic. That's sort of the, that's sort of the problem of the end user of the method. If that makes sense. If the system's chaotic, that's for the end to deal with. But when it comes to working out what the system is doing, that, that's fine. If the system wants to be chaotic, it can be chaotic. Any other questions from the board? So, as an extension to the previous question, I was wondering uh, how close is this to causal inference? Because it makes sense, it makes more sense uh, from a variational inference uh, kind of thing. So, could this be extended to a variational deep model rather than causality? Because you, can, you didn't talk about any uh, button uh, confounding variables and uh, any. Uh, button bias, like uh, a button criterion and stuff like that. I, I simplified a lot, but the, the technique we used to solve this is actually just variation conditions. Yeah. What it, it's a, a simplified variation. Okay, so this would be extended with a uh, Yeah, yeah, if you want to. It's actually um, stop stealing my ideas. Don't tell everybody about <laughs> <that one. laughs> uh, Any other questions? Yeah, I've got, I've what, what, what this, I'm sorry. Uh, do you, do you want to go off and then? So um, the pandemic modeling, I'm interested to understand the, the data sources that you had access to. Did, did the UK government make available diverse data sets? That yes, um, there is a public. Uh, so firstly, I, I, I want to make clear that I didn't develop this model. Someone, someone else developed the pandemic model. I didn't go away and do all that myself. Okay. I, don't, I don't want to claim that. Um, it would have been cool, but I didn't, I didn't do that. Um, but yeah, there, there are a couple of um, UK government sourced resources on this that, that are maintained in GitHub's repos that you just curl and you get the, the things. Does it include data for things like, things that you might not think would be directly, have a direct, direct impact, but in, but in fact turn out to? Um, things like, I don't know, days of the week or holidays? And yeah, so something that's in this, I mean, it's a bit unfair to just keep blowing up the picture here, but something that is in the model is like latitude and longitude. That, yeah. that has quite a strong effect, or is at least something you have to quite strongly control for. Um, but yeah, that, that type of thing is in uh, Any other questions? What, what, what would the solution uh, look like when it comes out? I mean, you, you're putting in some kind of um, uh, prior knowledge, so you, you're assuming some kind of uh, Binomial or, um, or a sinusoidal type um, formula, I guess. And then does it add to that, uh, or does it literally choose the, the function for you as you go along? A, a, do you mean a sort of solution? What, what would a dynamic cause modern solution look like? Yeah, yeah. What, what it would look like is it would look like an estimated probability. It essentially boils down to an estimated probability distribution for what the values of each of the parameters would be. Um, and if you wanted to get, if you wanted to like pick a solution, you could pick the maximum likelihood estimate of each of those parameters. 
And the, so also you, the, pre yeah. the parameters are obviously of a model that you've you've put in. So, so yeah, you know, right? Okay. So kind of going back to what I said earlier, the number of parameters in this case is that changing? Can that change? Uh, that that is usually the, that's the sort of model selection procedure, selecting between the different dynamic systems. Yeah, that's, that's so is there a way then to assess your length prior? When you, when you say this is a certain number that's sort of the problem with Bayesian inference, yeah. right? That your your prior is a subjective prior yeah. that, that is your best estimate of things. And I mean, you can do things like you you can do like sensitivity analysis on prior. You can go if I change the prior by this much, how much does it affect the results? And if changing your prior a little bit makes things change a lot, maybe you need to reconsider what you're yeah. doing. I want to suppose a way maybe uh, deliberately over parameterizing with some kind of pressure. To yeah. So the, the the sort of way. Again, I sort of didn't discuss this with brevity, maybe I should have. The, the sort of approach to this stuff is, uh, and the, well, one of the reasons I don't uh, like it, is that you specify quite a big space of models, but particularly, uh, and you sort of work through them, but there, there is a trick one can do, which essentially amounts to, if I evaluate a massively over-parameterized model first, with everything that could possibly be in it, then I can evaluate some models of that with things taken out very, very quickly. So as you, what you're saying to like use an over-parameterized model is like, is essentially what we do. We start from the most over-parameterized model and then we pick the one that's best from there. So from an entrepreneurial aspect, you have a model that's based on cognitive uh, neuroscience and hmm? and uh, those algorithms. How do you package this in order to, to sell it to the finance school? Because you realize that it's I think that is going to be exactly how we do that is going to be the, the, the sort of million dollar question, right? Um, exactly because you know ultimately I'm not like a cognitive neuroscientist that I don't know what all the finance people exactly want. Um, but yeah, the, the the sort of packaging that we have found appeal from at the moment is twofold. Firstly, is the explainability and risk management side of this, because like I said, you are not inferring a model, you're inferring a model, you're inferring a model, sort of. Um, so that, that's quite attractive in, in, in the finance space. Um, yeah, I forgot what the other thing was. Carl, I'll, tell you if I come, I'll tell you if I remember. Question for Christine. Christine, are you on the line? And am I right in thinking that you're coordinating internships for my students? Uh, I can certainly help uh, advertise and um, encourage students or let them know, yes. So, my name students who are interested in the um, internship opportunity that we'll share, should they speak to you or directly to Will? How should we progress on that? Yeah, come speak to me. Um, so it would be good um, to take the internship discussion forward um, and have perhaps a more, more detailed description of, of what you're looking for for the internship, just so that our students get a better idea of the sort of methods or applications that you're interested in. Um, and then I can spread the word amongst the students. We've got weekly, weekly chats anyway. I think the majority of students, let me just check how many people are in here. Um, but I can definitely spread the word um, amongst the students again and then have a discussion forward any description that you have and any detail that you have um, and then try to uh, make connections. So we're highly up Christine. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, any other questions? I haven't managed to remember what the, the other thing I was thinking about. Um, uh, this is more of a discussion uh, point and a question. Uh, um, I mean, this this is it, it. It feels quite supervised. So, I mean, I guess with neural nets, um, you know, deep neural nets, the idea is to kind of um, find, you know, um, patterns that you don't expect to be there, and you know, they they try to form some kind of function approximation. But the problem is they're not they're not too explainable. So you kind of want to. Um, something in between. So, yeah, I'm just thinking along the lines of trying to kind of, because there's, there's wavelet uh, transforms, which are to me quite explainable, but you, 
you need to find the kind of, uh, you know, like actual wavelet or the various wavelets to compose. And then uh, I'm just trying to think, is there something in between, you know, I'm just playing with ideas. <laughs> Where you uh, you, you offload some of the, the heavy work to a deep learning, but you try and keep it the explainability kind of thing. I remember the other. Um, so we can return to it in a second. I remember the other thing that we were we were practicing. Um, it's the so a complaint we've had when we brought this type of technique to the Bayesian methods to the finance people before is that they don't like how expert you have to be. They don't like all of the work you have to go to specify the models and sort of how difficult it is to specify the triers and how difficult it is to understand stuff. And because of the because of the easy way of doing things, where you basically start from a big model space and you sort of chop all the bits off that don't work, you can potentially sort of do an auto machine learning thing here, where you get the where you get the, essentially get the finance people to specify a big a big blob of stuff and then pick out the stuff for them, sort of re reduce the expertise needed. They only really need to specify the parameters they're interested in and sort of like how confident they are in the things might go there. Sure. Any more questions? Excellent. Well, please, please join me in thanking you again. Really great engagement. That's fantastic. Recording. How do we do that? Oh, I missed that the text question. Okay. Um, I don't know how to stop the recording. Maybe I just hang up. Oh, no, wait, that's not the text question. That's me.